So let's get started with our second talk for tonight. We're going to learn how to protect our landscape and garden plants from lawn herbicides. And here to teach us is Dr. Harlene Hatterman Valenti. Harlene is the high value crop specialist at NDSU. And on campus, she primarily teaches about herbaceous ornamental plants like annuals and perennials. Her research is focused on helping horticulture growers to maximize their yields and profits. She also works with researchers to evaluate the human health qualities of horticulture crops. And she raises awareness of consumers like us to the health benefits of horticulture crops. So Harlene, welcome to the forums. Okay, thank you, Tom. Welcome. So, yeah, so tonight I'm gonna to talk about some work that I started, oh gosh, um, 30 some years ago when I was working on my PhD. But I still think many of the aspects are, are relevant for tonight. And, you know, as a homeowner, I'm a homeowner, everyone wants the best of both worlds. We want to have that nice, um, lush green lawn. And, and yes, as an instructor of herbaceous ornamentals, I would die for a backyard like this. I just, I mean, as just like Jan likes almost every bug, I, I love almost every ornamental, um, especially herbaceous ornamentals. And so um, my backyard, uh, the grass is getting less and less as I make more flower beds, but I, I don't know if my husband would ever let me put a circle in the middle of our yard. Um, but anyway, you know, so we, we want both of these, but you know, it's really difficult to have the best of both worlds. A lot of us have good intentions and it's like, okay, this year I'm going to go and, you know, for my dandelions, which you can see a few there, you know, the best time to control perennial broadleaves is in the fall, not in the spring. In the spring, the growth is all going up to new growth. And, and so, not down to that perennial part, that perennial root system that's going to overwinter. So you make those applications in the fall, which is another good time because um, late in the fall, when all those food are being translocated into that perennial root system, this is a good time when, if you're like me, by that time, I'm pretty much done with gardening. Um, now things have just gotten away from me weed wise or, you know, I have you know, the neighbor has just said, if you bring one more zucchini to me, I will go and move out of the neighborhood or something like that. So it's usually a, a, a good, a much safer time to make those applications to go and control those perennial broadleaf weeds. Also in the, in the springtime, we just start getting really busy. Um, as Jan said, the yeah, there's you know, only so many, so many hours in a weekend to go and get all of this stuff done outside. And so it, it sometimes we have the greatest intentions, but it's just not enough. So we'll go and probably get help, probably hire someone to go and, and spray our weeds for us. And I'm not saying, you know, like this ad is trying to say, yeah, if you don't spray your lawn, you're gonna have a weak lawn. Um, there's a lot that goes into a healthy lawn and a healthy lawn does do a much better job of uh, not allowing these weeds to go and come in. It's when you have a thin lawn that there's a lot more opportunities for weeds to emerge. So knowing that you, you, know, you might be calling someone to go and help, um, there's a number of lawn care services and they all have a different way of making their um, herbicide applications to go and control those dandelions that you will go and see and see that um, sea of yellow in somebody's backyard and go, oh gosh, that means in a, in a few days or to a week, I am going to have all those things flying over and landing in my yard and trying to get started. So what I did when working on my uh, PhD, I said, well, you know, there, there's better ways of making these applications that will probably go and help to go and not have 
off target movement and not have injury to those um, ornamentals that you are, especially those broadleaf ornamentals that you wanna keep healthy. So I looked at something like that. And of course, you know, this is some of those symptoms that you wanna avoid. Uh, for example, the tomato, you can see how, uh, how tightly that is curled and the leaves are, are curled up and the stems are twisted or even with that orange cornflower, you can see how this is a much, this is still a synthetic auxin or a plant growth regulator herbicide, um, but it has much different symptoms than what you see on that tomato. Here now we're seeing some puckering of the leaves and cupping up of these leaves and, um, and the flowers start to look like they're senescing. And then on the rose, we see even more different symptoms. We don't see so much, uh, we see a little bit of some symptoms on some of the smaller, newer leaves and petioles, but mainly what we see is that those, the flowers of those roses are, are, are dying. And so, and these all are the things that will happen with these uh, synthetic oxins. And this is what we're trying to avoid. So what I did was I, I went and wanted to see what would cause more injury. And so I used three common application methods. Uh, the one on, on the right is commonly called a Kemlon gun. It's a spray gun that throw a much lower pressure, uh, tends to go and have larger droplets and uh, less small droplets. The middle one, I was an example of somebody with a flat fan nozzle. Now this produces smaller droplets, but generally for a post-emergence application or something where you want um, this to land onto the foliage, you're a little bit of, if you have too large of a droplet, that droplet, when it hits that leaf, it tends to bounce. You want something, a droplet small enough so that when it lands onto that leaf, it then spreads out and stays there. Um, and then this last one is, is an example of a raindrop, which, is more like a, uh, it has a, a much larger uh, distribution of uh, larger droplets, not as large as the Kemlon gun, but it doesn't take the kind of volume that the Kemlon gun takes to make an application. So I looked at these three and what I did was I set up my spray path to always be the same, and then I set up my downwind um, targets, off target sites. And what I found was that, so you can see here, um, what I have is I have these mylar and they're kind of like overhead um, projector um, acetates in which they were set at 90, 150 and 210 and, uh, centimeters downwind. And so 90 centimeters, about a meter, a meter or about a um, uh, one yard, three foot. And, and so you can see with the spray gun versus the flat fan versus the raindrop, which has those larger droplets. When we look at the distance downwind, I didn't have anything specifically different with those three application types. But what I did see is that the closer I was, to my spray swath, the more off target herbicide that I, I had. And on this, I actually just used a fluorescent dye and then I um, rinsed those mylar uh, targets. And then I used that um, fluorescent dye and a spectrophotometer to go, or fluorometer actually, to go and quantify the amount of uh, spray drift that moved down tar downwind. And so that makes sense. The closer you are, the, the more you're going to have. The further away, the less there was. But really there wasn't much difference. There wasn't any difference statistically between that 150 and 210 uh, centimeters downwind. Now, when we look at the averages of the three spray uh, nozzles, we see that the spray gun had less downwind 
drift than the flat fan, and that's the only real difference there. The other thing that I went and used was tomato plants. And at that time, um, triclopyr was coming up, was on the market. It was rather new broadleaf herbicide. And so I used triclopyr to go and, and see what kind of visible injury symptoms I could see. Um, so I had two plants and one of them, I went and I took back to the lab right away and I, um, rinsed off of the, the fluorescein dye that was in that spray. And the other one, I brought what it was dry, I brought it back to the greenhouse and I took um, injury evaluations. So again, what we see this time is that at that 90 centimeters, that we had more, um, more drift with that flat fan in comparison to the spray gun. So same as what I showed at the first one. And that also correlated with injury, but you can see how much more injury by having uh, that we saw with the flat fan in comparison to that raindrop. So the raindrop, when you look at it, there was only a little bit over two and a half um, percent more uh, spray drift that went to 90 centimeters, but because that was all those much smaller ones, droplets, that then that tomato plant went and uh, absorbed, you can see how much more diff, uh, how much more injury we got there at 90 centimeters. And that also was true then at 150 centimeters, but we didn't have, I mean, it was that much further downwind, so we didn't see as much injury as we did at the 90 centimeters. And so with that, um, what, I, what I really concluded was that, you know, the spray gun was the best way of making these applications to avoid off-target movement of your droplets. But what I also found out is with that spray gun, when you're trying to make, you have a border and you're trying to make, uh, you're, they're supposed to be making this spray application. They're supposed to just move your wrist 45 degrees and back, no, 90 degrees and back. Um, and, and what happens is a lot of times when you're flicking that way and then you're trying to come back, you tend to overcompensate. And so I even had a commercial applicator making this application because I felt like, you know, I couldn't go and, and accurately do this. And still I had some, what were, um, right next upwind that we're getting droplets. These were direct droplets from human air. And so my conclusion was, is that you have to have at least a foot border <laughs> to avoid some major injury, even with that spray gun because of the human air factor. And so with that foot, you can go and just use your little dandelion digger or whatever, but you know, some other means of trying to go and and um, control those perennial, those broadleaf perennials that might be a problem. So with that, I went and I said, okay, so if I can't completely eliminate off target movement, what can I do to go and figure out um, to reduce the, the amount of injury to these um, off target plants? So what I decided to do is I was gonna, I used 2,4-D and triclopyr and I sprayed reduced amounts to various annual bedding plants when they were right in that early flowering stage. And, and so what I found with that was that petunia was the most susceptible species. It was the most sensitive to 2,4-D and triclopyr of all of those that I have there. And it was also more sensitive to triclopyr than 2,4-D. And so it was like, oh, okay. But when I looked at all of them together, what I found was even though petunia was the most sensitive, begonia was the next, so wax leaf begonia was the next. And those were all similar to what I saw injury-wise with marigold and pansies and annual status. 
Then our next group that were less sensitive uh, to this off-target um, drift were geraniums and patients, rose periwinkle, and salvia. So the, well, I have one more here. Oh, no, I don't, sorry. So my take home message was that if you were afraid of some off target movement, then use those last four as your border plants. And I looked at annuals because usually annuals are used more as a border plant than perennials. So when I got to uh, North Dakota State, I, you know, during that time, um, the trimet was becoming more important and, and um, people were using that because that had three herbicides in it and had a more broad spectrum control of broadleaf uh, weeds in a lawn. So I went and I looked at the difference between that trimet versus 2,4-D and dicamba. And I used another set of, of uh, annual bedding plants, but I wanted to keep some the same as that time when I was working on my PhD, just to see how things would work with that, because I had 2,4-D in my other study. Well, first thing I found out was that when you look at the, uh, the, this graph, we have the percent of injury and then we have the portion of the herbicide rate, so that sublethal amount. So we're going from nothing to 0.05 and then increasing. So it makes sense that as you increase that rate, you're going to see more injury. Well, what I found is that that top one is the TRIMAC. And so I had more injury um, with the TRIMAC than I did with the 2,4-D or the dicamba. But when you look at those lines and the rate of incline on those, you see that the 2,4-D is probably the driver in this whole thing because it's very similar uh, with the trimet to the 2,4-D. Oops, I should first um, go and say, and, and what I found from this study was that in my list of most sensitive to least sensitive, first it was ageratum, then it was sweet alyssum, then it was marigolds, which was equal to dahlia. Dahlia was really hard to evaluate because it just doesn't flower too much. Um, then we had, um, again, geranium equal to salvia, which was the same as before and the impatience. And then I also had snapdragons in here and they, those all came up as those least um, sensitive. And the main thing that I used to go and evaluate um, this injury was um, from the reduction in flowering. And so I'm sorry, I, I, had, I just took this out of the paper and there was no other way of really cutting and pasting it in. Um, so on the bottom graph, um, is the trimac. And you can see that, that as you're increasing your rate, the flowering generally goes down. Um, the next one's the 2,4-D and the top one's the dicamba. Um, the reduction in flowering was most obvious, of course, in the more prolific flowering spe <clears throat> excuse me, species, such as sweet alyssum. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was that with impatient salvia and snapdragon, they actually produced more flowers with those sublethal rates of dicamba compared to the non-treated. Not that, well, you know, it was significant um, in some cases. And we all know that um, these synthetic auxins at very low amounts can actually promote growth and are used in the uh, greenhouse industry for just that. Um, what we also saw, what I also saw was that all those rates of 2,4-D reduced flowering uh, except for that lowest rate with geranium and snapdragon. So again, of that, it seemed like 2,4-D was much harder on my annual bedding plants than dicamba. And here's just a few pictures. Um, the top one is uh, our ageratum or floss flower. 
Uh, the one on the right is the non-treated, and then you have the, the TriMet, and then on your left, you have the 2,4-D. Um, likewise, the sweet alyssum, the untreated or non-treated. You see here, um, actually the TriMet looks a little rougher on the sweet alyssum in comparison to the 2,4-D. When we look at um, then on the top, it's in patients. Uh, we really, it, it's hard to see much difference on that. Um, the, what the 2,4-D did is it really just stopped it from flowering um, and well, or delayed it at least for a period of time versus the untreated. Now with the um, marigolds, you can see the trimac went and started to cause that. It didn't stop the elongation of that flower stem, but it started to kink it. And then the 2,4-D really kind of stopped it again in its, in its tracks. Um, Snapdragon on the top, you can see again here, the trimac looks to be a little bit harder than the dicamba on it. And then sweet salvia, no, red salvia, I don't, why I said that, um, the untreated and untreated there on your right. And you can see here the, the 2,4-D really just stopped that from flowering and, and pretty much uh, really uh, stopped any kind of flower production there. And then um, I, didn't have the, I didn't have this in the study. I didn't have enough plants to really sh um, have statistical differences. Uh, and we, it was really hard to see much differences. This is gazania. And really what, I didn't see much injury with dicamba at all. And you can see just had some of that stem of that flower stem epinasty, but otherwise very, very subtle differences with um, gazania. Uh, with geraniums, didn't see too much with the dicamba, but you could see with the uh, 2,4-D, that flower uh, stem got thickened and you can see it, it caused kind of some cupping just, but you can also see a lot of epinasty that was occurring with those um, petioles. And here is our petunias. And, and again, you didn't see much epinasty with the dicamba and the twisting of the uh, flower stems like you did with 2,4-D. Both of them caused those petals to kind of reflex backwards. And then they really caused, a, they hastened um, the flower death. And so the flowers, if they were open, they didn't stay open very long. And uh, a lot of them wouldn't even open. So what about, what about vegetables? Well, you know, aesthetics is one thing. But now we're talking about, we don't, we don't just look at our vegetables, we consume them. So it's a much different um, situation. And, and so with this, um, there is no minimum residue level for these herbicides on vegetables. None of them are registered on vegetables. So there, those companies will not do uh, any kind of testing to find out a minimal residue level that is acceptable on them. So really no level is acceptable. And the other problem is, especially the Solanaceae, tomato, pepper, potato, even eggplant, they're really sensitive to these um, plant growth regulator herbicides, as are the, uh, your foliage like lettuce and uh, spinach, along with peas and beans. Peas are probably the least sensitive because a lot of times you'll get enough cuticle that you can um, not have as much of that uptake. So, you know, with this, the pesticide product label is the law. So if you're going, if you do see that you have non-target edible crops that have been injured by these um, herbicides, then and it doesn't take much to cause much injury that you can see. Really, the, the fruit or food produced by those plants is not recommended to, for eating because we just don't know what is the minimal residue level that is safe on these. 
And the same um, is true with composting. And I know Carrie's going to be talking about this next in, in that you, um, you have to be really careful on when you use lawn clippings to go and help prevent weeds from coming. And a lot of people go and I use lawn clippings in my um, garden as well to go and, and slow down the evaporation of the, of the water as well as reduce weeds from coming up. But you should wait for six weeks after that application before you use any lawn clippings so six weeks after that lawn's been sprayed, and that doesn't mean, oh, I'm waiting six weeks, I'm gonna have this super long, you know, tall grass, and then I'm gonna cut it all off and go and use it in my garden. No, you'll still go and use your, do your weekly mowing, and after six mowings, then start collecting your grass clippings if you wanna put them into your, your garden. And there's certain products like clopyrrolid and combinations that have herbicide combination products that have clopyrrolid in them that have, are now discontinued for use on lawns. And that's because the residues that were in those grass clippings, um, even after they were composted, caused problems. And, and so, and even after, if you wait it for six applications, they still cause problems from the um, grass clippings and they injured um, the, the vegetable plants. Here you see the commercial production of uh, uh, zucchini in which I would be so upset if I ever saw something like this. And it was because it wasn't, this is hay that they brought in um, probably um, as an organic producer and they've spread the hay around thinking that they were going to uh, uh, help with the weed control. And what they didn't know is that um, the, the hay had been gone and sprayed for broadleaves with clopyrrolid and thus causing all this injury. So anytime when uh, labels containing clopyrrolid, or even now there's a newer one, which is in that same herbicide family, it's aminopyrrolid, um, and they're not labeled again, they're not labeled for on, on lawns, but they are labeled for pastures. And so um, if those labels aren't followed in the hay, manure, grass clippings, or even compost, um, containing these materials, they can make their way to a garden or landscapes and, and cause that soil con uh, contamination and herbicide injury to those non-target plants. So the thing to do is be really, really careful in those um, instances and, and, uh, and especially um, with these combination products, you really have to go and make sure that you look at the label and, and really understand what is there. Um, there's so many times that I've had um, a farmer bring in a, a tomato sample and they're going, I don't know what happened. And, uh, and he goes, must have drifted from across the road or something like that. And we end up finding that Oh yeah, in the fall, he applied um, something like clopyrrolid to go and, and control his weeds on the place and then, um, or in the lawn, and because he had that herbicide. And then in the spring, they used the grass clippings and they ended up um, causing injury to their tomato plants. So with that, I think that is it. And I probably, Hopefully I'm on target. Did a great job. Did a great job, Arlene. Thank you for staying on time. We appreciate it. We got a veteran group here tonight. They, they've they gone through this before, and so they're easy to manage. Okay, uh, we're going to open it up to questions. So if anybody has a question, they can scroll down to the bottom and type your question, your Q&A. We have a couple of questions. One about your research here. When you, Arlene, when you said injury, is that, is that the same as visible symptoms or did you do any um, chemical testing or? Yeah. 
No, um, good, excellent question. That was visible symptomology. Um, the, the hardest part with these plant growth regulators and doing some kind of a, a test for residue in the plant is they're quickly metabolized. And, and so if you aren't out there right away, I, and I've seen grape growers where, I mean, you see the injury, they collected leaves two days later, they couldn't find anything in there. So very difficult to go and find residues. Um, and it takes such a small amount of uh, uh, soybean growers found that out with dicamba, uh, that soybeans are so sensitive to dicamba that, I mean, it just doesn't take much and, and you see all kinds of symptomology. Okay, we have another question here. Let's say the lawn care service is common to your yard and is there any material that you would recommend that you could use to protect the plants or shrubs from getting um, sprayed upon? Well, of course, a physical barrier. Right. You know, but who wants to go and put up a brick wall? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I did think it was interesting. I was reading an article where they were trying on tomatoes. They were trying to use um, uh, your wilt proofs. Uh, oh, really? Go and and reduce injury. And what they they found was that they could reduce, you know, your anti transference. They could reduce the injury, but they couldn't eliminate the injury. So um, I think that's something that I want to start to investigate. Is looking at okay, can you use those anti transference on bedding plants and you know make that application the day before someone comes and, and be able to really reduce that amount of injury from any kind of potential off-target movement. Yeah, I would just say that, that lawn care service communication is so important that you will not tolerate spray drift. And also you don't have to be spraying dandelions two or three times a year. So that the best defense is just have no lawn care service out there spraying just maybe just in the fall one time does a pretty good job. Yep, I agree. Right? That yep. fall application um, do, is amazing. And uh, then you can, you know, if you, a little dandelion there, it's almost therapeutic, you know? <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful flowers. Uh, can you describe a little bit more about that spray gun that you used in your research? Yeah, okay, so it, 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 um, it's just, it's called a spray gun. And basically it's, a, it's putting out a, like four times the volume and it has much larger um, holes for the spray. And so it's more like droplets, large droplets instead of little spray droplets. Um, and most of, most of the lawn care businesses will be using something like that be just because in a residential um, location, you never know what kind of wind currents because of buildings, how wind direction can change and all that kind of stuff. And so with those larger droplets, and it doesn't, it makes, it doesn't really produce any fines um, because there's very little pressure with that. Um, because of the so much larger volume that you're that they're spraying with. Okay, we have a, a comment from someone that says that if you want specific information for North Dakota um, and the label for North Dakota plants, go to the www.kellysolutions.com slash nd. That must have the appropriate label. If you have a question, always follow the label. Yep. That's really the key. Um, okay, here's another question, Harleen. How concerned should we be of the vapor drift from lawn chemicals? That's a general question. And are we concerned about herbicide residual on a new garden spot? Okay, so um, two very loaded questions. Right. Um, as far as vapor drift, um, you know, most of the, the compounds that are, that's one nice thing about being in North Dakota. 
Um, so the esters for 2,4-D are more volatile than the amine formulation, but it's, you know, so the esters when you're getting above 85 degrees Fahrenheit is when you start to be concerned about volatilization. Well, um, we don't, we don't get that many days above 85. <laughs> and those occur mid July. Who in the heck is going to, should be spraying during that time of the year? No one should be. So, um, so I, I don't think uh, with the formulations available now that volatilization, especially with 2,4-D dicamba, yes, they were showing this with the, the farmers and the soybeans, but again, soybeans are extremely sensitive. They're, you know, that canary in the mine, uh, which is the, the key indicator. And, and so, um, so I, I wouldn't be concerned about um, vapor drift. And now I already forgot the second question. It has so. to do with how about the concern of a herbicide residual oh, on yeah. a new Resilient. garden? Yeah, and, and carryover. So if you have a new garden, um, I guess it depends if it was in the past, if it was a uh, uh, part of a yard that cattle were at or a pasture where cattle could have been grazing or that they could have been spraying um, something like graze on, which has the clopyrrolid in it, um, or even, um, you know, some of these other ones, picloram, which has a very long residual. But um, the herbicides that are registered for use on lawns today don't have that long of a residual. So I wouldn't be concerned um, with that unless it was some area that was completely void of plants, which indicates that they used a soil serulent, which has very long residual and you probably won't have to worry about trying to grow anything there for a while. Right. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, usually for a homeowner, if they're going to start a new garden out of a lawn, they probably use glyphosate or the traditional Roundup. And again, the whole key is to read the label and they'll tell you, you know, actually you can rip, you can, you, you want to wait till the glyphosate works, but usually, the label that says like three days has very short residual, but usually you give it a couple of weeks for the chemical to work. But those that Trimec does have a more persistent residual. You got to read the label carefully. Even with lawn clippings, read the label. There's some some uh, very common products that you see at the garden center. They will say on the label, do not use lawn clippings, period. Yeah. Not four weeks, six weeks, just don't do it. So there's some real persistent chemicals, even on the garden center shelf. Well, and, and I think a lot of that labeling is, uh, it's better safe than sorry. Right. And, and so they can't, they can't go and how are you going to, how are they going to prove that you didn't wait those six and it's just it makes litigation all that kind of problem be and so and i agree with you as far as the glyphosate you know usually you want to wait about a week because you if you have perennials and you start working that up after three days something like quack grass you're just going to cause yourself major major problems canada thistle if you don't wait a week to really kill those perennials uh, all you're doing is spreading more all over the place because you're going to get all these little roots and uh, little um, rhizomes or creeping root systems and you're just going to distribute them all over your garden area and you're going to be really in uh, a lot of <laughs> headache. So. Okay, um, here's a question again about those spray guns. Is there anything available to homeowners that is a duplicate of a spray gun in terms of the off-target movement or herbicides? You know, like what about opening the nozzle of a homeowner type spray so it sprays larger droplets? Right. Is that the way to go? Or should yeah. we spray at a lower pressure? Um, so you can go both ways. And most of the time, those pump up sprayers, you can go and open it so that it, it makes a very small cone type spray. And those are much larger droplets. Um, you don't really want to have a stream just coming out from there because um, 
then you're going to just get a lot of bounce and, and um, it's going to be, um, then you can also cause problems. Um, but then also don't pump it up so much, do more, you know, a couple pumps spray and, and a couple pumps more. A lot of times you got those backpack ones that you can just do one little pump and some spraying and you won't build up your pressure so high. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, both things need to be done uh, to go in and get larger droplets. Okay, so we're gonna go through a lightning round here to try to whip through some questions. What do you think is the greatest factor affecting spray drift? Is it the high air temperature or the wind speed? Wind speed. Okay, great. How long does it take for a garden to recover from being uh, treated, affected by a chlorpyrrolid? Oh, ah, that's a, that's a good question. So I did a study, somebody brought in some potatoes. Um, it was a commercial grower. They were go growing those potatoes for seed. And they were told, they were asked, did you use anything like clopyrrolid, any kind of clopyrrolid products? And they said, no. Well, all of a sudden the potatoes came up looking kind of funky. Um, and we took those potatoes and we planted them back as seed. And the new plants came back looking kind of funky. And we took then those seeds and we planted them back again. And still we saw symptoms. Um, I'm not sure it breaks down though in solanaceae. I'm not sure copyrolid co ever really breaks down uh, that much in those plants. Yeah, and in a, in a contaminated soil, I think, you know, three to five years is not uncommon for it to persist. And there are tests that a gardener can do to see if their soil has been um, cleaned up, so to speak. You know, you can put like peas and beans are very sensitive. So there's recommendations about doing some monitoring. So like get a get like three clay pots and mix it up with 50% garden soil, 50% potting soil and plant your peas and beans and then also have three other pots that just have the potting mix and then grow them and then see if you can see a difference in the performance of the plants. So those are like, uh, what do you call those kind of plants that you scout with, you know, monitoring. Oh, yeah, so, but three to five years is not uncommon. That also real quick, that like municipal garden ways, municipal uh, lawn clippings, that can also be contained made because they all, people who have perfect lawns, they spray a lot and they, they can use some of these uh, mm -hmm. persistent chemicals. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I got some, uh, okay. How do you want to kill clover, a clover cover crop before you plant vegetables? What, what herbicide do you want to hit it with? Uh, again, I would use glyphosate. I wouldn't yeah. use anything with the residual. I agree. And, uh, how do we, how do we stay ahead of, uh, oxalis? Again, oxalis is one of those where it, just like crabgrass, it, it really needs to have for that seed, some sunlight. So a thick turf grass is, and a healthy turf grass is the best way, um, excluding that light so that you don't have the oxalis coming in. But about, they're so small, you can just pull those out. Yeah, just, <laughs> how about creeping Jenny? Are you a fan of that? Yes. Well, creeping Jenny, um, uh, of course, your your trimac is is good. But I also back when I was at Iowa State, I looked at um, mule, twenty mule team borax, and for some reason, creeping Jenny ground ivy. Right? No, that's creeping Charlie. Sorry, creeping Jenny. That one's going to be really difficult. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a problem when we use these common names like Jenny, Charlie, yeah. but uh, you're right, ground ivy. But, uh, you know, you know, this is where the law comes in. I like how you emphasize the law and mm -hmm. they don't recommend using borax for creeping no. Charlie. It's not a registered herbicide. No, that and, is true. Yeah. Um, but in some areas where not near, well, and that's another thing is, it, it is extremely sensitive, though, to boron, but boron can also accumulate. So 
you know, you have to go and really weigh those things. And, and, uh, but if you were, you know, strictly wanted to go and, and be organic and not um, use a synthetic uh, herbicide, uh, then you, you probably have to uh, keep at it with some kind of a vinegar, non-selective vinegar type uh, or clove oil or something like that and just stay just at to it. Just keep scorching it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> I think uh, there's a question from Connie who's wondering like what could have harmed, what kind of herbicide could have harmed a red stem willow tree, but that's hard to say. We really have to look at this look at the symptoms mm -hmm. and um, maybe this is a good point to say if you suspect there's uh, some mischievous activity you can always call the North Dakota Department of Agriculture their pesticide enforcement division they are the experts and then come your property and they can do testing if necessary so again the North Dakota Department of Agriculture is a has a pesticide enforcement division that you can call upon and the last question a herbicide to control botrytis, but I think if you mean botrytis, that's a fungus. Yeah. So you'd want to use a fungicide for that, mm -hmm. not a not a herbicide. If you use a herbicide, your well, poor you peony bush would be very sad. <laughs> <laughs> you would kill botrytis and your plant. There you go. Okay, Harleen, thank you very much for your presentation. You're it was welcome. Very thank interesting. You.